All right, brethren, let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Now, in the first three chapters, Paul declared that every child of Adam is depraved, a guilty sinner. And he showed that no sinner is justified by our works. Absolutely no sinner is justified by our works. But he showed there is a righteousness to be had by the sinner. That righteousness is by Christ the Lord, by His obedience, and it's freely given to us through faith in Christ. Now, you remember Paul concluded chapter 3 with three things we saw last time. Three things that faith accomplishes. Well, in this chapter, he's going to illustrate those three things. And we're going to just take the first one today. Now look there in Romans 3.27. He showed that boasting is excluded through faith. He said, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now he's going to illustrate that using Abraham and David. Watch Romans 4.1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. And it, the righteousness of Christ, was counted or imputed unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Or through faith, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to him. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So Paul uses two men here that the Jews highly regarded. Abraham, who was the friend of God, he was the father of the faithful. And he declares plainly here that Abraham believed God, and it, the righteousness of Christ, was imputed unto him for righteousness. And the other is David. He's a man after God's own heart. And he places the happiness of a man the blessedness of a man, not in his works that he's done, but in God justifying him freely by his grace. He said there's where true joy is. That's the true blessedness. Not only is boasting excluded through faith, but also true joy lies in being justified, made righteous, freely by the grace of God. That's where true joy is. Being justified by another. Being justified freely by the grace of God and not by our works. That's true blessedness. So today I want to look at Abraham's blessedness. The word blessedness means joy. Here's Abraham's joy. First we're going to see how Abraham was stopped from boasting. And then we'll see after that why sinners are saved apart from our works. Why did God choose to save sinners apart from our works? And then thirdly, we'll see why this is where true joy really is. First of all, what stopped Abraham from boasting? Was it his works or was it that he was saved through faith? What stopped him from boasting? Well, works would not have stopped him from boasting. It says there in verse 2, If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. 
If it was works that justified him, he would have reason to glory, to boast in himself. Now, I want you to remember what it is to be justified. To be justified before God is to have established the law in perfect righteousness and to be completely without sin. That's to be justified. You have established the law in perfect righteousness and you're without sin. That's what it is to be justified. It's for God to declare you righteous and without sin. Now, did Abraham obtain this justification by his obedience to the law given at Mount Sinai? You ask people in churches today how a man is made righteous. Or, or this is a separate issue, but you ask them how they're made holy. At some point, they're bringing the law back in. And they're going to say it's by man's obedience to the law. Well, Abraham shows us a man is not made righteous by the law because the law was not given for 430 years later. Galatians 3.17 says this. Paul said, This I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. God came to Abraham and he made a covenant with Abraham. He confirmed it in Christ. It was all settled to Abraham. And, God, and Paul says the law, which was 430 years after that, the law at Mount Sinai given 430 years after that, it cannot disannul that covenant, that it should make that promise of God without effect. In other words, that law did nothing to touch that covenant that God had made with Abraham. But you see, my point is, Abraham could not have been justified by the law because the law was given 430 years later. That throws out the window any notion that a sinner has or that religious folks have that a man can be made righteous partly in contribution by his obedience to the law. Abraham didn't even have it. And yet he established the righteousness of it and didn't even have it. Two, secondly, it, it was not by any other kind of works that Abraham was justified before God. It was nothing, it was not some sort of religious works or something like that, that justified Abraham before God. Our text declares if Abraham obtained justification before God by his works, he would have reason to glory. He would have reason to boast in himself. And that goes for any kind of works that he would have done. But the scripture says, look at our text, it says there in Romans 2, but not before God. Remember, God will not allow anyone to boast in ourselves for any part of our salvation, especially not our justification. In Isaiah 42.8, God said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. The praise due unto the Lord. The praise due unto Him. He says, I will not give that to another. So Abraham's not going to be allowed to boast. In fact, no sinner that God saves is going to be allowed to boast in anything that we did. So Abraham's boasting was not excluded by works. That didn't exclude his boasting. How then was it excluded? Abraham's boasting was excluded by God-given Faith in Christ. That's how. Look at Romans 4, 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God. That's what faith is. That's what faith does. Simply believes God. Go to, with me to Genesis 15, 1. What did Abraham believe? Look here in Genesis 15, 1. It's not how much doctrine you believe or how good you are at splicing and dicing doctrine. Faith is believing God. It's believing God is able to do what God says He will do. 
What he's promised to you he'll do, you believe God will do it, and you trust him to do it. That's faith. Look here. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You want to talk about rewards in heaven? There's our reward. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and he said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, number the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Be. He's talking about not just physical children. He's talking about spiritual children. He's talking about this is how many spiritual children you're going to have. You're not going to be able to number mine elect. There's going to be so many. And here's Abraham. He's not even had the first physical child yet. And God's promising him, you're going to have a child. And the main child he's talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's in Christ, he's coming through Abraham, and it's in Christ that all God's elect are going to be saved, and they're all going to be made to be Abraham's spiritual children. That's what he's mainly talking about. And look at the next word. And he believed in the Lord. And the Lord counted, he imputed it, to him for righteousness. What does that mean? He, he, he imputed it to him for righteousness. He, he counted it to him for righteousness. Our text says it was counted to him for righteousness. It does not mean his faith was counted as his righteousness. It does not mean that. It does not mean his faith was counted as his righteousness. Some thinks that's what it means. And they think it because, go back to Romans 4 and look at verse 5. It says there at the end, his faith is counted for righteousness. And men read that and they think that, that it means faith is counted as our righteousness. But it cannot mean his faith was counted to him for righteousness. It can't mean that. Look down at Romans, Romans 4.23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. You see, the very same it shall be imputed to us if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that it that it's talking about there can't be Abraham's act of faith. Because Abraham's act of faith is not going to be imputed to you and me if we believe. The meaning is the object of Abraham's faith was imputed to him. Christ and his obedience. Christ's righteousness was imputed to Abraham for righteousness, for his righteousness. It was Christ's righteousness imputed to him. And so Abraham was stopped from boasting through God-given faith in Christ. Christ said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. Now, sinner, this text clearly says, if you and I cease from our works and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then the righteousness of Christ shall be imputed to us also. So, cease from trying to boast in you. Cease from trying to, to commend your goodness to God and boast in your works to God. Now, none of us will say and admit that we brag and boast about our works. But before God, if you come to God trying to say, well, Lord, I did this and I did that, God considers that to be you bragging to Him about what you did. It's, it's worse than just boasting in front of men. It's boasting to God for us to try to come to God and say we did something that ought to make God accept us. 
Cease from that. Stop it. And if you're in unbelief, that's what you're doing. If you don't believe on Christ and cease from all your works, you're boasting before God that you're worthy to be saved. That's right. But he says here, repent from your works. Repent from you and believe on Christ and the righteousness of Christ shall be imputed to you. Now, that comes to our, we come to our second point. The reason sinners are not justified before God by our works, the reason God will not allow us to be justified by our works, and the reason we're justified only through God-given faith is so that that righteousness comes by God's grace. It's so that we're justified by the grace of God. Look at Romans 4.4. 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not imputed of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, through his faith the righteousness of Christ is counted as his righteousness, or counted for righteousness. Through faith, Christ's righteousness is imputed to the man that does not work. And see, that's all by grace. That's all by grace. If God imputed righteousness to us due to our works, then righteousness would cease to be by God's grace. Salvation would cease to be by God's grace. If any aspect of our salvation is because of something in us, salvation ceases to be by grace. In most churches, if a church will say anything at all about election. This is what they say about election. God looked down through time and He saw who would believe and that's why He chose them. If that's true, salvation ceases to be by God's grace. If that's true, salvation is because of you and something in you and not by God's grace. Grace is unmerited favor. So you might even say demerited favor. Because not only did we not merit grace, by our sin we demerited grace. But it's really irregardless of us, period. Because, because it's not based on anything in us, good or, or otherwise. Grace is God simply choosing to save whom He will save. Because that's His prerogative. He's God. He can do with His own what He will. If a person earns anything by his works, then it's not freely imputed to him. It's rendered to him because it's his due. He earned it. Do you want to be saved that way? You want to be saved that way? Let me show you what Paul says. If you want to be saved that way, let me tell you what Paul said right here. Galatians chapter 3. Uh, It says, verse 10, As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Do you see that? You're going to have to do everything in the law. Let me, get, let me just see if you have yet. Tell me what the 432nd law is of God. You didn't think there were just 10. There's over 600. Do you even know what the 432nd law is? I don't. I have no idea what it is. I'm just making a point. You can't be justified by the law of God. You don't even know what it is. <laughs> but you've got to do them all. You could have never been, you can't be conceived in sin, which we all are, from my mother's womb. You can't come forth having ever thought, done, or said anything sinful ever in all your life. That's why anybody that wants to be saved under the works of the law, they're under the curse. You're under the curse because you can't keep it. You just cannot keep it. See, righteousness is imputed freely by God's grace. 
to the sinner who does not work. He does not work. What he does is he believes himself to be ungodly, but he believes God justifies the ungodly. That's what faith believes. I believe God justifies the ungodly. Look at verse 5. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is, or through his faith, it's imputed to him for righteousness. Abraham knew himself to be ungodly. You know where he was? He was in the land of Ur. That was an idolatrous land. His father was an idolater, his mother was an idolater, and he was an idolater. And he would have stayed there. He had no heart to leave there. He would have been there and remained an idolater if God had not come to him and called him out of that idolatry and revealed what God was going to do for him and given him faith to believe God. That's how he was brought out. If you've been brought here to hear the gospel preached and you've never heard this before, it just may be God's bringing you out. It just may be God's calling you out of your former idolatry and revealing the truth to you. Are you listening? It's more than a man talking. It's God speaking. Are you listening? If you're His, He's going to make you listen and you're going to get it. <laughs> you're going to get it. Bless God, you're going to get it. Abraham was made to know he's ungodly. You know, a sinner will only cease justifying himself and bragging on himself when he's made to see he's ungodly. That means you're the un of everything God is. Y'all remember that old commercial for 7-Up? It was called the Uncola. Y'all remember that commercial years ago? The Uncola. Seven ups, everything Coca Cola's not. Well, you're the ungodly. Everything God is not. That's what we are by nature. That's what we are by nature. We are all as an unclean thing in all our righteousnesses. That is, every good thing you do. What mama and grandma brags on you about that's so good. All our unrighteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You ever given a sermon to somebody and it's a message that declares salvation is entirely by God's grace. Declares that God freely justifies His people by grace. That we're made righteous by the obedience of another, by the obedience of Christ. That we contribute nothing to our salvation. And a person comes back And they immediately go to justifying and defending themselves. Well, what about a man's will? What about a man's works? Well, what about a man's this and that and the other? What is that? That's defending a man against God. That's exactly what it is. You gave him a message that declared God is the one who saves. God is life. God is righteousness. God is holiness. God is wisdom. God is salvation. And the answer is, what about what I've done? What makes a man do that? He doesn't think he's ungodly. He does not think he's ungodly. But when God makes you see you're ungodly, then you stop defending your will and your works and you begin to commend and boast and glory in God's will and God's works. That's the difference. Men don't realize what they're doing. Men don't, do not realize they're betraying their heart by what they say. But it's no surprise to any believer. It's no, it's, it's no hidden mystery to any believer when men start bragging about themselves and defending their will and their works. They're saying, I'm lost! I don't know God! It's only when God makes you see what you are to your core, ungodly, then we'll cease bragging on ourselves. 
And when He makes you see He's holy and He's righteous and He's provided the righteousness for His child in Christ Jesus' obedience, that's when you'll start boasting and bragging on God. How did he have this faith? He said he had faith. How did he have the faith? That ought to leave him somewhere to boast in, shouldn't it? His faith? Not true faith. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith's a gift. Abraham knew himself to be ungodly, so he believed on God to justify him. He believed on God to make him no longer be ungodly. And only God can do that. Only God can make... When you're made righteous by God, you're not ungodly anymore. Not before the bar of God. Ungodliness and righteousness are opposite things. God finds us in ungodliness. He finds us ungodly. And that's all we are. We can't contribute a thing. And when God gets finished with His child... He's made you righteous and given you all things that pertain to godliness as a gift from Him. But it's through the, the righteousness of Christ by His obedience being imputed freely to us. Go with me to Romans 5.15 and look at this. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. And that's how we died, by the offense of Adam, by one man. Much more, now look, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Look at verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The law didn't enter for you to try to come to God by your works under the law. The law entered so that you would see how offensive you are to God. But where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see this? You and I in that first part are just simply dead by another. But in the second part, everybody that Christ represented Everybody that shall be born of Christ, everybody that should be created anew by Christ, He made us righteous by His obedience, and it's all given to us freely by the grace of God, and it reigns. Grace reigns. That means He abounds over our death and our sin and abounds unto eternal life, and it's all by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason God does it this way is the same reason He elects His people by grace. If by grace, then it's no more of works. If by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. It's got to be all of grace so it will not be of works. Now lastly, what I'm telling you today, this is where true blessedness lies. This is where true joy is found, right here. It's in God imputing to us the righteousness of Christ freely by His grace apart from our works. Look at verse 6, Romans 4, 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, the joy of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, people in will works religion. You know what, Paul, you know what God calls will works religion? Folks in, in religion that says salvation is in some part by your will, it's in some part by your works. You know what God calls it in, in uh, Colossians? He calls that will worship. 
It's not worshiping God. It's worshiping man's will. That's idolatry. And folks who are in that kind of religion, they're not happy. They do not have the joy that God gives. Now, they might put on a happy face, and they might try to convince you they're happy, but they're never sure they've done enough works. Never. And you can't be happy. You can't have joy if you think you still have to do more. You can't. You just can't. Will works preachers and discipline committees will not let people have joy in their religion. They make you constantly do more works. You have to do more. You can't ever rest. You have to do some more. And every will works religionist that I've known, that God called out of their former religion, every single one I've ever known told me they had no joy while they were in that religion whatsoever. They had no joy in it. They now have joy because they see the works are finished by Christ and it's all by God's grace. And now they can enjoy religion. Now they enjoy coming to the church service. Now they enjoy, they're not, they're not concerned that, that they're going to be brought up before some committee or somebody's going to uh, hunt, hunt them down because something they did or said out of turn or whatever. Because now they know everybody else there with them is just like them and knows they're just like them and we're all sinners and we're not trying to condemn one another for our sin. We're trying to point one another to Christ who is our righteousness. And Will Works Religion is all about pointing you to you and pointing you to me and me trying to show you how much better I am than you by walking over you and walking on you. That's what religion is about. Making, man look, making one man look good by making another man look bad. And you don't have that in God's church. You don't have it amongst God's people because we're all worms. You ever pulled back the dirt in a, in a worm bed and seen what worms are doing? They're just all wrapped up together in a mass of just looks like one big ball of worms. There's not one that's exalted over the other. There's not one that's sitting on a throne and the other's all subservient to him. They're just a bunch of mass of worms and that's what you and me are. And all our righteousness is in another, Christ the Lord. So we don't have any reason to boast. We don't have any reason to try to exalt ourselves over anybody. And we're not fooling God if we do that. We might fool man by that petty playground elementary bull, but we're not fooling God by it. This is the blessing of imputation. We're going to look at imputation more closely in another message. But imputation is not God imputing to us what we're not. That's not imputation. Imputation is not God imputing what we're not. Imputation is God imputing the righteousness unto us which Christ has really and truly made us by His obedience under the law on our behalf. That's what it is. I've heard men say, when God imputes righteousness to you, He's treating you as if you're righteous. Well, when He imputed Adam's sin to us, He wasn't treating us as if we were sinned, was He? No, He was, he was saying, you are sin, because Adam made you sin. And that's what Christ, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Look here in our text. It's fact. Verse 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The reason He will not impute our sins to us is because Scripture says Christ came to put away sin and in Christ is no sin. And God won't impute something to you you don't possess. He just won't do it. That's righteousness. That's righteousness. Therefore the Lord won't impute sin to those He brings to faith in Christ. This is the blessedness, brethren. Blessed is the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works. That's by grace. Here's the sum of it. God chose His people freely by His grace. God sent His Son by His grace. Christ justified His people freely by His grace. God calls us and gives us faith in Christ by His grace. And God imputes this free righteousness to us by His grace. It's all by His grace. And what that means is, because it's not by our works, since it's all by God's grace, 
I can't send it away. You can't send it away. We can't make it change. We did nothing to get it. <laughs> we can't do anything to lose it. It's all of God's grace. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto children's children. By His grace, you realize He saved us and called us before this world was made. Listen, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world was made but now made manifest in Christ, who's come and abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And when this world's no more, before this world was made, He had called us and, and, and blessed us by His grace. And it said His righteousness, His mercies from everlasting to everlasting. When this world is no more, we will still have the righteousness of Christ and it won't change. Listen, lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look upon the earth beneath for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. That's the word of the Lord. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Sinner, has God given you repentance from your dead work? Has He given you repentance from your dead works? Has He given you faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? If so, you have great reason to rejoice because this is God's Word. No weapon that's formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment trying to condemn you, you shall condemn. This is the heritage. This is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. There righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isn't that good news? <laughs> it's an unchanging, never-ending righteousness because it's all by the unchanging grace of God. Now, you try to come to God by your works, that's as fickle and foolish, that's the most flimsy thing you can try to build your hope on. You come to God in Christ's righteousness. You got something that'll last forever. Let's stand together. Oh, Father, we thank you that your salvation is entirely according to your grace apart from our works. We pray, Lord, you would, by that same grace today, that you'd fill our hearts and fill the hearts of your lost sheep, make us to behold you, make us to come to your feet and bow at your throne of grace. Make heaven and earth today all look in one direction and all look to Christ and all praise him for the great things he's done for us. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you, and we pray now in the second hour you'll bless us with another view of our Lord Jesus Christ. Teach us, Lord. We're slow to learn. We're slow to learn, and we need you to teach us. Be our wisdom, our revelation. Forgive us our sin. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.